Now, I'm going to be giving you a lot of verses. We're only going to look at one part of a verse, but I'm going to give you a lot of cross-references. Some of my points are going to be on the screen. You won't hear me tonight say anything that you haven't heard me say before, but I don't apologize for that. These are very important truths and doctrines, and I really encourage you to kind of buckle your seatbelt and give me your undivided attention. But let's back up in verse 10 and get a running start on our text. Paul says, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles, that's the schemes, the methods of the devil. There's our enemy. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. So we are in a spiritual warfare. Therefore, verse 13, take unto you the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, having done all to stand, stand therefore having, first of all, your loins girt about with truth, that's the belt of truth. Secondly, having on the breastplate of righteousness. And then thirdly, verse 15, having your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. And then in addition to all or in all things, taking the shield of faith, wherewith you should be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. And here's our text tonight, verse 17. And take the helmet of salvation. Take the helmet of salvation. Everyone realizes that when a soldier goes to battle, one of the most important things for him to protect is his head. You can have body armor on, but if you lose your head or your head gets damaged or it gets hit, you can be incapacitated or even killed. So also for the Christian soldier in our spiritual battle and war with Satan, we must protect our head, our minds, and our thoughts, and our understanding of truth. Satan wants to attack our minds to deceive us, to get us to doubt, and get us discouraged. Now what kind of a helmet did the Roman soldier wear? It was actually made out of bronze, and it covered his entire head, and it had a center section that came down between his eyes and over his nose, and then it came down on the sides of his face. You've seen many times in Major League Baseball when the batter's up there in the batter's box, the side of his face that faces the pitcher, the batter's helmet has a shield over his face and over his chin. Well, the Roman soldier's helmet had a, had a shield like that on both sides. So the only thing he exposed was his eyes, and his mouth, and his lower chin. And he would actually wear that in the battle. As I said, that bronze was actually then covered or layered with leather, so it would be cushioned. And this was so important. And they many times, it said that they would tie it to their belt so that everywhere they went, they had that helmet. And the minute the battle started, they would take that helmet, they would put it on, and they would go into battle protecting their head, this most vulnerable part of their body. If the brain is injured or the head is injured, we are definitely in big trouble. Now, what does the helmet of symbolize in our text? Now notice he specifies in verse 17, taking the helmet of what? Salvation. So he specifies that it is the helmet of salvation. Some translations render that which is salvation. But what does that mean? First point I want to make if you're taking notes, it could mean, and this is probably not what Paul had in mind, but it could be, and it's important to understand, it could be that he was actually saying, make sure of your salvation, or be saved, or take up salvation. Now earlier, he talked about taking up the breastplate of righteousness, and now he's talking about taking up the shield of faith. In verse 16, taking the shield of faith. And then in verse 17, taking the helmet of salvation. So the focus is not the helmet. The focus in the text by application is salvation. Now, in theology, this is what's known as soteriology, the subject of salvation. And it's as vast and as broad as the Bible itself. So we're not going to exhaust the subject by any means. Now, the fact that he's writing to Christians would indicate that he's not necessarily telling them to be saved, but it is possible, and because it's possible, and because it's important for us to understand 
salvation. I want to talk about that for just a few moments. What does it mean to take up salvation? It means to take salvation for yourself. You know, we hear the saying that God has no grandchildren, only children. So you have to make sure that you're saved, even if you're raised in a Christian home, even if you've gone to church your whole life. Even if you believe that there's a God, the Bible says demons believe that there's a God, and they tremble, but that doesn't mean they're saved. So if you're going to be effective in your Christian life, you have to be first a Christian, obviously, and come to a saving faith in Jesus Christ. Now, what are the steps in a sinner's salvation? Number one, if you're taking notes, is to realize that we are sinners in need of a Savior. You're not going to trust Jesus as your Savior if you don't see yourself as a sinner. Now, how does this happen? Simply, it says that the Holy Spirit comes to convict or to convince you of sin, of righteousness, and judgment. No one comes to saving faith in Jesus Christ without the Spirit of God starting pre-conversion, a work of conviction and convincing them of their sin and their need of a Savior and drawing them to Jesus Christ. If you look at your own salvation, you all of a sudden begin to realize or you came under conviction, I am a sinner, I'm going to hell, I need a Savior. Or you saw the emptiness of your life and you realized Jesus died for your sins and you came to him for salvation. You don't just kind of try Jesus or see if Jesus works or, yeah, that sounds pretty cool. I'll pray the sinner's prayer. I'll trust Jesus. You have to come out of the work of the Spirit convicting you and drawing you. The Bible says no man comes to the Father except the Spirit draw him. So salvation starts with the Holy Spirit. And I think that initial conviction and drawing to the Savior is something the Spirit does in people's hearts, which can be resisted, it can be hardened against, and we can resist that work of the Spirit and not surrender our life. So we must trust Jesus as our Savior. And then we have to repent. The word repent is the Greek word metanoia. And the interesting thing about this helmet over the head to protect the mind is that metanoia, repentance for salvation, involves changing the mind. The word repent, metanoia in the Greek, literally means to change your mind. And it carries the imagery of I'm going one direction, and then I change my mind about my sin, about the direction of my life, and about Jesus, and I do a 180. I turn around, and I follow Jesus Christ. So you come under conviction, you repent of your sin, you turn around, and you follow Jesus. Jesus Christ. And then the third stage of your salvation is receive. So if you're taking notes, write down, realize I'm a sinner, repent, change your mind, and it involves also your emotion and your will. You must trust him. And then thirdly, it's all tied together. You must receive or believe or put your faith in Jesus Christ. In John chapter 1, verse 12, it says, to as many as receive him, that is Jesus, to them those who are repentant, he gives eternal life. So you must receive Jesus, trust him as your savior. Now, some Christian groups get really uptight about this idea of receiving Jesus. And to try to kind of counterbalance that, they like to emphasize repentance. And they like to emphasize that you must receive him as Lord and savior. Now, whether I trust him as Lord and Savior, I don't think determines whether I'm saved. But if I trust him as a Savior, that's the important part. Lordship becomes a discipleship thing after you are born again. Whether I believe in him as Lord or not doesn't determine my salvation. I just need to believe that Jesus died for my sins, that he rose from the dead, and that he's my Savior. When Peter, in the book of Acts, or Paul, excuse me, in Acts chapter 16, verse 31, was talking to the Philippian jailer who asked him the question, what must I do to be what? Saved. That's a great question, by the way. Whenever a cultist knocks on my door, and it's funny, they knock on my door. I haven't even invited them, but they knock on my door. 
and they want to give me a false gospel or a false religion or some other way to get saved, I ask them that question, what must I do to be saved? And then I give them the answer from Acts chapter 16 and verse 31, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved, right? It's interesting, he doesn't even say repent there because the jailer was already repentant and already convicted. He just said believe. He didn't say behave. He didn't say get baptized. That followed as a result of his conversion. But he just said believe. John 3.16, whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. So to be able to stand against the devil, you have to go from being a child of the devil to being a child of God by regeneration or conversion. Here's my second point. Once you are saved, once you have been born again, once you are a child of God, what we need is, and this is what I think Paul is talking about, the helmet of salvation, we need to have assurance that we are saved. We need to have a confidence. We need to have a joyful experience of the reality of our salvation. There are people who are saved and they don't realize it. They have lack of assurance. There are people who aren't saved and think they are saved. So we need to make sure we're born again, make our calling and election sure. Then we need to make sure that we have that assurance, that confidence in our heart and in our life. Now, once you are saved, Satan knows that he's lost you. So what he wants to do is keep you from knowing you are saved and enjoying your salvation because you'll never ever be effective as a Christian serving the Lord or witnessing for him if you don't know that you are saved. Can you imagine trying to evangelize? Hey, you need Jesus. I don't know if I got him, but you can have him. <laughs> hey, Jesus will forgive your sins. I don't know if mine are forgiven, but I think he'll forgive you. That's, that's going to be a real effective witness, right? You need to trust Jesus. He'll take you to heaven when you die. I don't know if he'll take me, but I think he'll take you. So you're never going to be able to serve the Lord or live for the Lord or be a witness to the Lord unless you have assurance. I believe that the Bible teaches that a true Christian can be absolutely sure they're a Christian and that they can have absolute assurance that they're forgiven, that they have salvation, and that they're on their way to heaven. The helmet keeps us from being deceived and doubtful in our mind and in our thoughts about our salvation. Now, the deception of the devil about salvation is many times, as I would say, brings a false assurance. Now, this is a real delicate subject, and it really takes a balance of understanding the doctrine of salvation in Scripture. But there is such a thing as a false Assurance, And what I mean by that is there's people, because they go to church, because they've been baptized, because they intellectually believe that there's a God, and then they try to live a good life, or they've been confirmed, or they've gone to catechism, or been baptized, or whatever it might be, they believe that they're saved and going to heaven. Some of the hardest people to reach with the gospel are religious people who think they're saved and they're going to heaven, and they're not. And many times in the Bible, those passages that people think are saying you can lose your salvation are actually warning passages to say, make sure that you're saved. They're not telling us you can lose it. They're saying, make sure you have it. Make your calling and election sure. So you need to make sure that you are truly a child of God. Satan wants to come and either give you a false assurance. Now, I don't want anyone thinking that is not saved that they're saved. And this is why it's a challenge to preach to a congregation or a church. Because I don't, I don't ever assume that everyone who sits out here and listens to me preach is saved. I assume the opposite. And I want to make clear, are you born again? Have your sins be forgiven? Have you trusted Jesus Christ? I don't want to get to heaven and find out that I didn't make the gospel clear and people thought they were going to heaven and they weren't. But here's the opposite side of the coin. I don't want Christians who are saved to lack assurance that their sins are forgiven and that they are going to heaven. So it's a very fine balance there. There's those who have a lack of assurance and they don't really have salvation. But then there's those who are, are, are they, they do have salvation, but they lack assurance. Then there are those who have a false assurance. They think they're saved, 
but they are not truly saved. And you can't live a victorious Christian life if you lack assurance of salvation. Now, why do so many Christians, and I believe a lot do, lack assurance? Well, for starters, I think they don't understand what the Bible teaches about salvation. This is why I'm trying to get through this topic tonight, but I'm trying to make it as simple and as clear as I can. A lot of people don't understand the doctrine of salvation. Sometimes they lack assurance because they just don't know what the Bible teaches about salvation. And many times they think that salvation can be lost. Now, I don't know why I'm headed down this path because it's controversial and good Christians can disagree about this, but I have my deep conviction that if you have been born again, if you have been regenerated, if you are a true child of God, that you can never be lost. If God saves you by His grace, He will keep you by His grace. doesn't mean you're going to live a perfect life, but He will take you to heaven by His grace. Now, I know that so-called good Christians differ on this subject. Some say you can lose your salvation. Some say you can't lose your salvation. In my study of the Bible, I'm convinced that if you have been born again, you cannot lose your salvation. Now, that's not a license to go out and live a sinful life saying, I get to go to heaven, so I'm going to go live however I want. If you've truly been born again, you're going to want to live a life of sanctification and true godliness and true holiness. Your life will show evidence of true regeneration or salvation. Write down John chapter 10, verse 28 and 29. Again, these are multiple sermons. All these points could be spent many weeks on. But here's a great verse that indicates that when you are truly born again, you cannot be lost. John 10, verse 28 and 29. Jesus says about his sheep, he says, I give them eternal life. I give them eternal life. They shall never perish. In the Greek, it is no, never, ever perish. It's emphatic. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father which gave them me is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. So if you are a Christian, but you think that you're going to lose your salvation, you're not going to be able to have assurance that you're saved because you will stumble, you will fall, you will make mistakes, and Satan will capitalize on that and say, if you're really a Christian, you wouldn't think that. If you're really a Christian, you wouldn't have done that. If you're really a Christian, you wouldn't have said that. You're not really saved. And you get this idea that I, I need to get born again again. And again and again. We sometimes have people that come forward to every altar call. Every week they want to get saved again. How sad that is. It's so important for you to have assurance. I give them eternal life. They shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father gave them to me. He's greater than all. No man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. Now, I don't want to get too sidetracked, but some people will say, well, no one can take you out of the Father's hand, but you can take yourself out of the Father's hand. You can jump out of the Father's hand. No man means no man, and I think that includes you. And if you've truly been born again, why would you want to give your salvation back? And those who believe that forget that when you are saved, something actually happens to you. It's not that you just, I believe in Jesus. You are actually born of the Spirit. You are what's called regenerated. That's the life of God in your soul. Nowhere does the Scripture indicate that you can undo what God did in salvation, that you can unregenerate yourself. The moment you're saved, you're taken out of Adam, positionally, with all his sin, death, and condemnation, and you are translated into Christ. And nowhere does the Scriptures indicate that you can unregenerate yourself, take yourself out of Adam, and place yourself back into Christ. You cannot undo what only God can do. And there's nothing in Scripture that would indicate that. So I believe that you are safe in the Lord's hand, in the Father's grip. Write down Romans chapter 8, verse 1. We know it well. There's now therefore no condemnation 
to those who are in Christ Jesus. Let me tell you some very, very simple, but simply profound truth. Every Christian is in Christ Jesus. That verse is not about some super saints. We're the in Christ Jesus deeper life club. No, it's all Christians. So the moment you were born again, you were taken out of Adam the first, and you were taken and placed into Christ, who is the last Adam. And in Adam the first, his sin, death, and judgment is on you. When you're taken out of Adam, placed into Christ, his righteousness is imputed to you, and you are righteous before a holy God. Now, second reason some people lack assurance is they think they are saved by grace and yet kept by works. They haven't read the book of Galatians. They think they're saved by grace, but they're kept by works that they must continue to perform. Now, if you think you're keeping yourself saved, that's a tenuous foundation. If my salvation depended on me, I'm in big trouble. If your salvation depends on you, you're in big trouble. But I believe we're saved by grace, we're kept by grace, and we will, like the the song Amazing Grace says, grace will lead me home. Amen? He saved me, he's keeping me, and he will take me home safely by his grace. We're not saved by grace, but kept by works. We're saved by grace, kept by grace, and that's so important. And when they stumble and sin... Many believers who think they can lose their salvation, they have no assurance. They don't understand that they're kept by the power of God. And understand 1 John 1.9 is written to Christians, which says, if we confess our sin, he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sin and to cleanse us from what? All unrighteousness. I call that the Christian's bar of soap. Now, when a Christian sins... It breaks fellowship, but you do not lose sonship. It will break fellowship, but it does not mean a loss of sonship. So you want to restore fellowship with God so there's nothing between your soul and the Savior so that His blessed face you can see. So we want to abide in Him. We want to walk in the light as He is in the light. And when we know we've sinned, we want to confess our sin and be forgiven to have that fellowship with him. This is illustrated in John 13, and I've preached on that passage before. Remember when Jesus in John 13 in the upper room was washing the disciples' feet? And he came to Peter's feet, big, gnarly, dirty feet. I think feet are some of the ugliest part of the human anatomy. And Peter says, you're not going to wash my feet. No way, Lord. Remember what Peter, Jesus said to Peter? He said, if I don't wash your feet, you have no part with me. Change the word part to fellowship. No koinia, no, no, no fellowship with me. If you, you no participation with me. Now, when Peter heard that, he thought, really? Give me a bath. Let's go for it, Lord. Just give me a whole bath. If it means fellowship with you, let's do it. Let's do it right, Lord. Give me a bath. Then Jesus said these words. He said, if you've already had a bath, all you need is your feet to be washed. Now, they had public bathhouses. They didn't have running water in their houses, and they wore open sandals. So if you went out to take a bath, by the time you went from the bathhouse to the house, your feet would get dusty and dirty. So inside every home, they had a basin of water, towel, and the lowest of the slaves, the servants, would wash everyone's feet as they came into the room. So Peter is getting a lesson about fellowship. He says, Peter, if you don't have your feet washed, you have no participation with me. So when you are born again, you get a bath. But as you walk through this world, you walk through life, so to speak, your feet get dirty. And so almost daily, right, as believers, we need to say, Lord, forgive me for that thought. Lord, forgive me for that attitude. Lord, forgive me for saying that word I shouldn't have said. That was wrong. We're getting our feet washed every day by the Lord so that we can stay in communion with him or fellowship with him. We're not getting bathed again. We don't need a bath. We've already been born again, washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Spirit. What we need is our feet 
to be washed so that we can have koinonia with the Father. Let me give you three things that assurance is based on if we're going to wear the helmet of salvation. First of all, it's based on the Word of God the Father. The Word of God the Father. How do you know that you are saved? Simple as believing what God says in His Word. John 3.16, For God so loved the world, He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him shall not perish, but have what? Do you believe that? It's that simple. Jesus said it. I believe it. That settles it. Don't let the devil tell you anything differently. Second assurance is based on the work of God the Son. The work of God the Son. In 1 John 5, verse 11, this is the record that God hath given to us, eternal life, and this life is in His Son. He that hath the Son has life. He that has not the Son of God has not life. So God has given to us, present tense, eternal life, and it's in His Son. If you have the Son, you have life, and if you don't have the Son, you have not life. Jesus died on the cross, and He cried the words, Tetelestai, or it is finished, or done. So what you're doing is that you are resting in that finished work. Christianity doesn't say do, It says believe, and it says finished or done, and you rest in that. So when the devil comes to you and says, you're not really saved, you're not really a Christian, just tell him, say, Jesus died for my sins. Not only did Jesus die on the cross for my sins and cry, it is finished, but Jesus prayed in John 17, he said, Father, I will that those whom thou hast given me at salvation be with me in heaven that they may behold the glory I have with you before the world ever was. You don't think that the Father is going to answer that prayer? Jesus prayed for you, so he paid a price, and he prayed for you when he was in that upper room. And I believe that God will answer that prayer, that we'll be with him in heaven, seeing his glory that he had before the world was ever created, how important that is. We also know in Ephesians 2, verse 8 and 9, that we're saved by grace through faith. It's not of ourselves; it's a gift of God not of works, lest any man should boast. So salvation is grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. And then the third is the witness of God the Holy Spirit. So write down the Word of God the Father, the work of God the Son, the finished work on the cross, and then thirdly, the inner witness of God the Holy Spirit. 1 John 5, verse 10. He that believeth on the Son of God hath the witness in himself that he is the child of God. Romans 8, verse 16, the Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. So we have the witness within ourself. Now this is the subjective experience of the inner witness of the Holy Spirit. It's that knowledge of I know that I know that I know. I know what God says in his word, I know what Jesus did in the cross for me and his work, and I have the witness of the Holy Spirit in my heart. What a day that was when you put on the helmet of salvation, when you were born again, and the sky looked bluer, the birds sang prettier. I never heard birds singing until I got born again. The grass was greener. People looked nicer. Hopefully I did too. And you just had a new joy, and everything just was just radiant. I'll never forget that day that I sat on the beach south of uh, Ventura up in the beach, and I said, Lord, come into my heart, forgive my sins. I must have sat there for a couple hours just crying and repenting and pouring out my heart to God. And as I left that beach that day, I just felt so forgiven and cleansed and felt like a weight lifted off my shoulder, and I knew that I was a new creation in Christ. My life has never been the same since. I put on the helmet of salvation. But let me say this. The helmet, thirdly, is also the hope of salvation. So we need to be saved. We need to know that we're saved. And then thirdly, we need to have the future hope of our salvation. We need to realize that God will finish what He has begun. Now, this is taken from 1 Thessalonians 5, Verse 8. Now, if you want to flip there in your Bible real quick, you can do that. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 
and verse saying, by the way, this Sunday, we're going to start 2 Thessalonians in our series on Sunday morning. But notice what Paul says in 1 Thessalonians 5.8. Let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and for a helmet, there it is, the hope of salvation. So in Ephesians 6, it's put on the helmet of salvation, or which is salvation. And then in Thessalonians, he said, let's be sober. Let's put on the breastplate of faith and love. But for a helmet, let's put on the hope of salvation. Now, what does he mean by that? It would seem almost contradictory when he said in the Ephesian epistle, let that we put on salvation and that we have assurance. Now we're hoping that we're saved. I don't get it. We're crossing our fingers. We're holding a rabbit's foot. We're saying, I hope, I hope, I hope, I hope that I'm saved. No. When the Bible speaks of a believer's hope, it's speaking of a steadfast assurance. You could actually define hope in that way. It is a steadfast assurance. It's not, I hope it will happen. It's, I know beyond any doubt. I know that my Redeemer lives. I know I will go to heaven when I die. I know my sins have been forgiven. And Satan is going to come at you and attack you and get you to doubt your salvation. You wear that helmet of hope. So very important. I thought we were saved. Yes, we are. Now, you've heard me say it a million times, and I'm going to say it a million and one. Salvation has three tenses. Has a past tense. It has a present tense, and it has a future tense. If you don't understand the tenses of salvation, you will not understand your Christian life. You've been saved, you are being saved, and you will be saved. Let me explain it as simply as I can. Number one, we have been saved. That's justification. We're saved from sin's penalty, This is our past sins are forgiven and that we're positionally in Christ. Every Christian has been justified. Justification is the act of God whereby he declares the believing sinner to be righteous. And he does that based on the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. So the hope of salvation that we have been forgiven. Then secondly, we are being saved. This is sanctification. These are all biblical terms describing what it means to be a Christian or be saved. So we have been justified, and then we are being, present tense, sanctified. That's saved from the power of sin. So justified, saved from the penalty of sin. And sanctified, being saved over my lifetime, gradually, from its power, from its control, from its hold. When you get born again... You you don't perfectly grow up in Christ and never sin again. But as you walk with the Lord, you won't be sinless, but you will sin less and less and less and less as you grow in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ. So sanctification starts at your salvation, and it ends in the third stage, which is called glorification. We will, future tense, be glorified. So we are justified, we are being sanctified, we will be glorified. This is salvation from the presence of sin. This is the hope of salvation. That means that every one of us as Christians should be looking for a city whose maker and builder is God. We should be living for the blessed hope of the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. If you are a Christian, this world is not your home. You're on your way to heaven. So let your contact with the world be as light as possible. Amen? And the more heavenly-minded you truly are, the more earthly good you will be. The more earthly-minded you are, the less you will be good for the kingdom of God. Seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these other things shall be added to you. So when we put on the helmet as a hope of salvation, that's basically saying in simple terms, I'm looking for heaven. I can't wait to go to heaven. I'm longing for heaven. I'm groaning for glory. 
I want to be with Jesus. But until I go to heaven, I'm here right now. I want to grow in sanctification and likeness to Christ. So this third stage, glorification, is the deliverance of sin's presence. When we get to heaven, guess what? They'll not be in heaven. Sin. Amen? No more sin. No more sickness. No more suffering. No more sorrow. No more death. For the former things are passed away. Amen? So this is how we're to live with a helmet of salvation, with absolute assurance and the hope of heaven. But Satan wants you to have a deceived mind, thinking that you're not saved, a doubtful mind, not sure of your salvation, and a discouraged mind that you won't make it to heaven. Don't let the devil have that influence on your life. I love Romans chapter 8 where Paul says, For I am persuaded that nothing can separate us from what? The love of God which is in Christ Jesus. Not height, nor depth, nor any other created thing. Paul opens Romans chapter 8 with no separation or no condemnation. He ends it with no separation. So what a glorious thing to have a helmet to protect us, that helmet of salvation. Making sure that you've repented, you believed in Jesus, you've been born again, resting in his word, resting in the finished work of Christ, having the inner witness of the Spirit, and longing for heaven and living for heaven. Amen?